Well, good morning. morning. So good seeing you guys today. So grateful for those that are able to join us online. Today we are kicking off a new series called Joshua. We're looking at just the story of this person, the character of Joshua in the Old Testament, developing the heart of a warrior. We're going to dive into this starting today. And before we get into that, I just want to start off by asking a question. How many of you guys, when you were kids, I know we still have some kids in here younger, but how many of you that are older kids, you know, enjoyed watching superhero shows and movies when you were a kid, All right? Now, now, how many of you actually put a cape on when you were a kid because you wanted to be that superhero, right? I mean, you know, I just want to make sure I wasn't a weird one here in in church, you know, and, and I think that, you know, we, we enjoyed doing that and watching it because I think that, you know, the way that God has created each and every one of us being made in the image of God, as the scriptures tells us, and especially when we come to faith in Christ and we have the work and the power of the Holy Spirit alive in us, that God has instilled in each and every one of us this desire to be someone great and to do something great. I firmly believe that's how God's wired us. He created us that way in his image to make a difference in this world around us. And so so as kids, we loved watching superheroes that could do the impossible, that could take on the impossible, right? And so when we were younger, we pretty much thought we were invincible. We'd put on that cape and we'd run around and we'd do things. Matter of fact, one year when my my kids were younger, my two oldest daughters, especially when they were were little, I I set out one morning, you know, we were, you know, hanging out just having fun, to convince them that I was Superman. Now, I had a lot of convincing to do, right, um, because I don't look like Superman by any means. And how many of you remember watching the black and white TV show Superman, right? Remember that one? The guy did not look super at all, did he? I mean, he was just kind of like this middle-aged guy that really, and he was wearing tights. It was like, what's wrong with this picture? You know, and he just didn't look like he had muscles or anything, right? So I had to convince my kids that I was Superman, and I told them, you know, this is how I was trying to get them to go to bed at night. I said, look, you need to go to bed because every night when you go to sleep, I become Superman, and I fly around the world, and I help people. And so you got to go to bed so I can do this, and it's a big secret, and they're like, no, uh Dad, you're not Superman. You just think you're Superman, right? You know how kids say things, right? You're not really Superman. So then I had to convince them. I said, all right, I can prove it. And they're like, no, you can't. You know, I said, okay, you stand right here. So I had them at one end of the hall, and our bedroom door was down the other end. I, you know, my brain just works weird, right, okay? I come up with all these weird, strange thoughts of how I'm going to prove to them that I'm Superman, right? So I said, you just stay right here. So I, I run down the hall to our bedroom. I said, all right, I'm going I'm to put my Superman outfit on. And in my mind, I'm thinking it through. So, so I had this pair of sweatpants that were blue, dark blue, and they had that satin sheen. You know what I'm talking about? A lot of sweatpants made of that satin sheen to it, so I, was, I put those on, right? So then I, I had a, a red basketball, you know, T-shirt. I, I put that on, and, and then my wife was just recently in a wedding, and she had this long satin red dress, all right? So I folded the whole upper part of it over and took a piece of ribbon and tied it around my neck so you couldn't see that the upper part of the dress, all you could see was this long, beautiful red satiny cape, all right? And so I'm inside the bedroom with the door, and I, I pop it open. I said, all right, all right, all right, girls, I'm going to get around and show you, but you got to promise. I'm going to show you really quick. It's going to be really fast, but you got to promise you won't tell anybody, right? You can't tell anybody. They're like, okay, we won't, we won't, we won't. So I, so I open the door and I grab the end of that dress and I flaunt this big cape and go running right back inside and close the door. <laughs> and their eyes just got really big and they come running down. They're like knocking on the door. Their eyes are really big. And I pop, I pop up the door and say, Dad, Dad, we, we want to see it. We want to touch it. We want to see it. We want to see your Superman outfit, you know, your Superman, you know. And I'm like, no, you got to promise you can't tell anyone. If, I'll let you see it, but you can't tell anyone. We won't. We won't. And their eyes are really big. So I open the door. They come in. I set them up on the bed. They're like, whoa. You really are Superman. Never forget it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Didn't say that. Should have. This is why you need to go to bed, right? But it didn't take very long after that that I proved that I'm not, I really wasn't that super after all, right? Because we all make mistakes along the course of the way. But I think that when we're young, we just kind of have this, this desire to be someone great and to do something great. And I really firmly believe that's how God wired us. As a matter of fact, many of us, you know, as kids, we, we'll put on those outfits and we'll run around, you know, and try to be that person. And then as we get a little bit older, 
right? Because we, we go through the bumps and the hurts and the habits and the hang-ups and the challenges of this life. And it's all of a sudden we, we start to lose sight of the impossible and we begin to think that nothing's possible, right? And we become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin and the brokenness and the challenges in this world. And we kind of give up hope of ever being someone great or doing something great, especially for God and the things of his kingdom. So then when we have kids, we start living vicariously through them, right? And so we see them, you know, as, as when we were kids, we watched our superstars out on the field playing sports. Remember how many of you watch sports? All right, now, now let's just say, how many of you have a jersey with somebody else's name on it, all right? Now, why do you have a jersey with somebody else's name, all right? Because we like our heroes, right? We like our stars. And when we were kids, if you remember, you know, I used to go out, you know, playing, playing football or playing basketball. When you're out there, let's say, playing football, I wear a jersey with somebody else's name on it. And when I'm out there running as the wide receiver, you know, it's like, I want to be that person. I'm thinking I'm that person because I want to be great like that person, Right? <laughs> But then after we learn over time that we're not that person, we're not really that great, then we start living vicariously through our kids, right? And so we want them as they're doing sports or gymnastics or, or cheerleading or, or, you know, some other, you know, arts thing. You know, we're living vicariously through them because we want them to believe that they are someone great and can do something great, right? Even though we may lose sight of it. I firmly believe that God has desired for us to be, created us to be this way. And so today we're starting this series on the book and character of this guy by the name of Joshua, who God was calling him to do really something that was really hard. And he was just you know, confronted with some really big challenges that, that lied ahead. And so I'm just going to give you some background here. But what we're going to be looking at today is just moving forward into the new. And I, and I want to start this, this study on the book of Joshua because I, I really feel it's relevant for where we are today in culture and as a nation. And that, and that what the things that we're going to be up against, much as we're going to see with Joshua, what he is up against, um, was up against, is that it's really, there's a lot of the same things throughout the history of mankind that are still the same. Things that we, we go through, challenges that we go through. And Joshua's getting ready to lead God's people into the new. And as things are opening up past this whole last year, leading up into this year, and all the craziness and challenges that we've had to go through, and that we're still going to be going through as things are constantly changing. And if there's one thing we've learned over the last year into this year, is that culture has shifted greatly. And there's a lot of challenges that are in front of us. And so we got to learn how to move into the new and moving forward into the new. And so this is what we're going to be looking at the study of Joshua. Now, what Joshua's up against is, as I shared with you guys last week, if you were here with us, we're talking about Moses, all right? And God called Moses to go and stand before the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh, and tell him to let my people go. They had been in Egypt for four centuries, over four centuries all right, they had become slaves. They were mistreated, beaten, and, and I talked to this last week. And then, and then God said, go before Pharaoh, time to let my people go. And then after all these, these crazy things took place, then Moses is leading the people out of Egypt. All right, and then as I shared with you last week, God, you know, led them in a roundabout way towards the wilderness to, in their trap between the Red Sea and all this stuff is going on. So now, fast forwarding the clock, now after they've gone through the Red Sea and they've gone through the wilderness and, and on this whole journey, now they're on the cusp of entering into the promised land, the fulfillment of all that God had promised his people through Abraham, who he called generations prior to this to go to the land, to leave his home, to go to this land of Canaan. This was the promised land, and God was going to do great things in and through Abraham. He changed his name from Abram, exalted father, to father of a multitude. That God was going to do impossible things in him and through him. And then, as we know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that's when the famine hit. Then they go down to Egypt, all that craziness. Well, now they're getting ready to go back into the promised land. All that God has in store for them is in front of them. And so God tells Moses to send some spies into the land. So Moses sends 12 spies into the land to check it out, to investigate, see what's in the land. This land of promise that God is leading him into. And they go into land and they come back and they're like, wow, there is just incredible crops here. There's, there's this fertile area in the, in the land. It's just amazing, all this stuff that's there. It is a land of promise. It is a land filled with milk and honey. However, there's no way we can do this. 
There are too many of them. And not only are there too many of them, but there are giants in the land. They are so much bigger than us. They will squash us like ants. And they started giving just a bad report about what God was leading them into. There's no way that we can do this. The challenge is too great. We're all going to be killed. As all we've already been through already, it is not a good place to, for us to be going. We don't have what it takes to get there. And I just want to start off with this bullet point. What's going on during this time, if, during Joshua, is that God's people lost perspective on the promises and focused on the problems. Now, we just came off a whole series on the promises of God. We didn't hit nearly the tip of the iceberg on all those over 7,000 promises that are in God's word. And yet what's taking place during the time of Joshua is that they now have the word of God. When Moses was on the mountain, he gave them the law. All right, we get the first five books of the Bible, right, through Moses. All right, Genesis, the book of beginnings, right? Exodus, their, their exodus exit out of Egypt towards the promised land. And while they're going through the wilderness, then we get the law. We get the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, okay, which are the key portions of the commands, the directives God gave his people on how we're to live and follow these things. And the book of Numbers is just kind of this whole genealogical part of the people of, you know, of God living through all that they were going through during this time. So we get the first five books, and Joshua picks up right after that. All right, so we got Genesis, Exodus, Viticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Now we're going to pick up in the book of Joshua. But what's going on is that God's people, they've lost sight of the promises, and they start focusing on the problems. And we can't do this. We don't have what it takes. We're not smart enough. We're not skilled enough. There's not enough of us. There's no way we can enter into what God has in store for us. And they all started losing perspective. Now, I'm saying all this just to give you some background because this is what Joshua was up against. It's going to be challenging enough going into this land, all right, because studies on the land of Canaan, as archaeological surveys have been done, they've dug through stuff that it confirmed things that were in written history, that this was a land just filled with, with just all kinds of just idol worship, occult practices, just wickedness, sexual immorality. I mean, you name it. They were murdering children for sacrifices to their gods. And archaeological discoveries found that they would literally take little kids and stuff them in clay jars and put a seal on it and suffocate them. And they would bury them in the walls of their temple as a sacrifice to their god. So what's going on is, is this is known as the conquest period where God's leading his people back into this land of Canaan is that there's a spiritual cleansing and renewal that's taking place. God's doing something both in his people's hearts and in Joshua as a leader as well as in the land that they are entering into. But there's, there's all this undercurrent of we can't do this, we're never going to do it. So I want to just look at Numbers chapter 14, verse 10. This is what Joshua was up against. Because Joshua and Caleb, they came back and said, why are you discouraging the people? And so then all of a sudden the people start turning against Joshua and Caleb. It says the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. Now would you want to lead that group? That'd be really tough, wouldn't it? to try to lead a group of people that are out to get you. And so this is one of the part of the background that Joshua is up against. The whole community is against him and Caleb, and they want to stone him because they don't want to go forward. They want to stay stuck, as we talked about last week. They want to stay stuck with where they are rather than walk into all that God has in store for him. And so my challenge for us as we're going through this study is that we don't end up in the same place that the other 10 and the whole community end up, that we would be like Joshua and Caleb as we move forward into the new, as culture shifting. We might still be in the same land, but culture is always changing and shifting, and the stakes are too great for us to become inward and start attacking each other in our own community of faith. Amen? So we're going to learn as we go through this. So, so here's the deal. Joshua is also Moses' assistant. He's his right-hand man. The whole time God spoke to Moses and told him to lead his people, Joshua is right there, is his right-hand man at his side, helping him every step of the way. So God speaks to Moses. Let's go back. Numbers 27, verses 18 and 19. This is God speaking to Moses. And this is what he tells him to do. He says, Take Joshua, son of Nun, who has the Spirit in him, and lay your hands on him, 
Verse 19, present him to Eleazar the priest before the whole community and publicly commission him to lead the people. So what Moses is doing here from God's directive is he's setting him before the whole community. He says, this is your next leader. This is the guy you're going to be following. Now think about this, this mindset. There's a whole generation that's with Joshua that they're out to get him. And so Moses is now setting him before the whole community. He says, this is who you are going to follow as we're going to trust God and his word and his promises and move forward regardless of all the challenges that are in front of you. And there's all this strife and turmoil that's going on among the people of God. And this is to an entire generation who witnessed some of the most miraculous things by the hand of God. Coming out of Egypt, seeing all the plagues and the miraculous hand of God, the things that they witnessed, seeing the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night as they were there, you know, felt like they were trapped between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army. I talked about that last week. And then God parts the Red Sea and they're able to go through on dry land to get to the other side, and as they're going through the wilderness, they just so quickly, just like we do, just lost sight of the promises, start focusing on the problems, like, we've got nothing to eat, right? How many times have you ever not had something to eat, right? I mean, most of us here are probably pretty blessed, right? And they're like, we have got nothing to eat, so they start grumbling and complaining, so what did God do? He provided manna, which is said it's, it's like angel food, it's from food from heaven that showed up every morning on the ground, This sweet manna that they got to eat, but then that wasn't good enough. They complained about that, right? It's just our human nature. They began grumbling, complaining, we want meat. We had meat back in Egypt. We were able to go to Logan's Roadhouse, and there's not one here. (laughs) And now all you guys are hungry, right? So we want meat. So they began to complain, so what does God do? He miraculously blows this wind in and blows all these feathers, these pheasant quail, all this stuff in so they could eat, Right? They could eat this quail, and they had their fill of it all, right? And then, and then that still wasn't good enough. And then they get to a place as they're wandering through the wilderness towards the promised land. Then there's no water. We need water, right? And so then God tells Moses to take his staff and strike the rock. And by this time, Moses, he's just fed up. He is tired and angry dealing with these stubborn people. And so Moses, unfortunately, he takes that moment and he strikes the rock, but he dishonors God in his anger as he strikes the rock and water comes gushing out. God miraculously provides for them, but that disqualified Moses from even being able to enter in. Okay, so this is all just kind of this setup. So Moses is, he, you know, he's speaking to an entire generation that got the book of the law, that felt the mountain shake when Moses was on the mountain. They heard this heavenly voice. They know all these things and seen all these things. And yet out of an entire generation, only two guys were allowed to go into the promised land. Were allowed to move forward into what God had promised for his people. This is what it says in Numbers 32, verse 12. When it talks about those that are going in, it says the only exceptions are Caleb, son of, let's just say Jeffrey, because that's a lot easier to say than that word, all right? Or son of Jeff. We'll just say son of Jeff, right? The Kenizzite and Joshua, son of Nun. Somebody said a joke to me. He said, how could he be a son if he was a son of Nun? Anyway, that's somebody's silly joke. He told me after last service. It says, for they, here's the deal with Joshua and Caleb, they have wholeheartedly followed the Lord. Now, that's a key distinctive. They wholeheartedly followed the Lord. They didn't get focused on all the issues, all the challenges, all the problems that were in front of them. They kept their focus on God and his word, and they wholeheartedly followed the Lord. And because of that, they were going to be able to go into all the promises that God had in store for his people in the promised land. Now, I intentionally want to go into this series and just look at what God's doing in Joshua's heart, because I think there's so much we can learn as we are moving into the new. As as some would call today, we say, you know, some of the buzzwords are the new normal. Whatever the new normal is, whatever it'll look like, there's all kinds of challenges as a nation, as a culture that are in front of us, really even around the world. There's, you know, culture is shifting and if there's anything we've learned over the last year into this year, it'd be like if you watch The Wizard of Oz, you know, and you're Dorothy standing in Oz and realizing we're not in Kansas anymore, right? Things have 
changed. And all of these hot topics and hot issues have come to a head over the last year. And they're very challenging and they're very sensitive and they're very touchy topics. If you even say one of them and use a, a buzzword and one of these words, you will start an argument or a fight right, will break out because we are so emotionally charged over all of these things. And so we want to learn from, as we go through this story of Joshua, on how to approach, how to lead a generation into all that God has in store for us. For Joshua's goal was to do this. And we cannot lose biblical perspective along the course of the way. This past week, I'm going to throw out a buzzword here, all right, one of these hot topic buttons that get us, gets people amped up. This past week, I was listening to a podcast, and, and this, this scholar and this pastor was going through some of these hot topics throughout Scripture, and he threw out one of them, which is the word privilege. And, and I know that if you mention the word privilege today, or if you've even classified it white privilege, that that stirs up all kinds. Oh, don't even get me started, right? People start getting all worked up over this whole thing. And he, but he, he, there was this one thing that stood out to me more than anything else that, that I think just brings it all to a focal point. As he said, if there's ever anyone in the course of the history of mankind that had privilege, it was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was fully God and fully man. And he the divine one, the son of the living God, had access to all of God's kingdom and its power and its privileges. And yet the scripture tells us, especially when we get to Philippians chapter 2, that he who had all this privilege and he who had his divine rights as the son of the living God, God the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, he set aside and gave up his rights for the sake of of the oppressed and the broken and the downtrodden. And he said, that's how we're to live. That's what we're called to as Christ followers. And, and that in that, as I began to reflect on it, I said, man, that is, that is so good. That's where our focus needs to be. As we move forward, as we've been going through all these things, you've heard me over the last year, everything we've been going through as we move forward is to have, in Philippians 2, it says, have the mind, the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who had privilege in every way, yet set aside his rights and his privilege for the sake of the oppressed. And every one of us in this room are the oppressed and the broken and the downtrodden. Because we were separated from the living God and we were in desperate need of a Savior. Caught and trapped in our sin and our sinful nature, but yet God saw that and he gave up his privileges to set us free. And now he's called us, as he called Joshua, the things that Jesus faced in his day were not much, diff not much different than what Joshua faced in his day. And he's calling us, as he called Joshua, to go forward and move forward and to confront all the challenging issues that were in front of Joshua. And the same thing when Jesus came on the scene. Jesus had to confront all kinds of cultural issues. Jesus had to confront all kinds of religious mindsets. The people in Jesus' day that were keeping people oppressed, one of them, apart from Rome, was God's people, the religious leaders. They classified people as unclean. And sinners. And they kept them oppressed by their mindset, by their biases. And so my challenge in all this for us is it is this looking and learning from Jesus, looking and learning from the scriptures as Jesus confronted culture and he confronted all these issues, he did it with grace. And yet he would call people out. Jesus never condoned sin. He never blessed people in their sinful lifestyle. Matter of fact, when people were caught in the act of sin, Jesus called them out and, and he lovingly and graciously restored them and then gave post-ministry instruction and would say, go and sin no more. You are now free from this life. Go and sin no more. So Jesus engaged the culture of his time, the issues of his time, and he changed the world. And so as we study Joshua, I want us to kind of look and learn because Joshua was up against all these things, all these challenges. And he's got God's people that are already, there's a whole generation that's against him. And now Joshua's got to go and he's got to lead. And most of the older generation, the whole old generation is being left behind except for two 
Joshua is not part of the younger generation. Him and Caleb are of the older generation to lead the younger generation into this new land. All the challenges that lie in front of him. And so what Joshua had to do was he had to have a mindset change and stay focused on the promises of God and leading God's people to tackle all the things in front of them in order to accomplish the work of the kingdom that God called him to. Amen? So let's look at Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. We're going to start. I'm just kind of setting this up as a backdrop. What we see in history is not really changed through the course of time. And we've got to be able to navigate God's word through all the challenges that are in front of us. So Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, all this background, everything that Joshua's moving into, it says, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Now I just want to kind of pause here for a moment because I think this is so important for us. I know that sitting here in this room, there's multiple generations of people. And anyone that's my age and up, we come from a very different generational mindset about culture, about church, about what it means to be a Christ follower, right? We all, we all have our own set of mindsets and, and biases towards things. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying we do. And so Josh was working through the same thing, right? He's going to have to confront all these things. And even though the whole generation that he's a part of is not able to go in, those things still carry over to the next generation many times, right? As we'll see as we go through as he leads his people into the promised land. And so what's important here is says the Lord is now speaking to Joshua. And if there's anything we need as a people of God today, the church at large, just not our church, but the church, the body of Christ, we need to be able to do now in the midst of all the challenges that are in front of us is to hear the voice of God, that we can speak into all the challenges that are in front of us. And to hear and clearly know what God is saying and what God is directing, as we're going to see here as we pick up next week, just the significance of the word of God in Joshua's life as he's leading his people through. We need to hear God speak. It goes on in verse 2, Joshua 1, verse 2. Then he says to him, the Lord's speaking to him, he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people. The Israelites, these are God's people. The time has come for you to lead these people across the Jordan River and into the land I am giving them. Now, you've heard me say this over the last year. Amidst all the challenges, everything that we're going through in culture, in our nation, in the world, this is our time. We only go around once. We only have one life that God has given us. And yet we see this mandate in Scripture that God has not asked us. He's commanded us to go and change the world with the good news of Christ. We've been entrusted, right? We've been entrusted with the message of hope, the message of eternal life. And so here, you know, Moses, God is speaking to, to Joshua, says, Moses, he, it's, not, it's not Moses' time. Moses was, he did this, this work that I called him to do. Now it's your time. It's your generation. You're leading this next generation. It's your time to lead. And I would just firmly believe this is our time as God's people to lead forth and lead out. The church needs to be leading out in the midst of all the things that are in front of us as a culture and as a nation. We can't ignore these things and just hope they'll go away. We can't just hope that everybody's just going to buy into what's going on and all the craziness going on, but we've got to be leaders in leading out and understanding God's words. We're going to dive into next week a little bit more what Joshua's up against and what God tells him to do in order to be able to tackle the challenges that are in front of us in a Christ-like manner to change the world with the good news of Christ. Now, if you were knowing that you were being appointed, you know, to lead in the midst of all the craziness, and if we knew all these challenges were going on, would you like, get me out of here, right? Because I don't know about you, but for me as a pastor, I had someone tell me this week, it's like, I do not envy at all you being a pastor in the midst of everything that's going on today. It is not easy navigating a community of people of faith through these challenges And I don't feel like I'm skilled enough or smart enough or wise enough, but I'm working on getting there. And I'm going to be reading and I'm going to be studying to help us navigate through the challenges that are ahead. 
Because there's all kinds of things. And during this time when Josh was getting ready to move into the new and move God's people, there's all these reservations and all these fears, and, mo- and God calls him to move into it. So what I want to do just this morning, I'm just kind of setting up where we're headed in this, is I want to kind of go through three M's of ministry that I think is important for us to grasp as we tackle challenging issues that are going on in our culture around us. All right, and these are things I learned in ministry um, training years ago. The three M's of ministry, and the first M, M word, is message. The message. The message. And I could give you a ton of verses on this, this message that God has given us, the message of God's word, the promise of salvation through Christ alone. And the challenges with the message is so important for us to understand when it comes to God's word is that it never changes. God never changes. Book of James, it's not in the notes, but Book of James says that, is it, is it things around us might change, but God never changes. His word never changes. It is a constant. It is an absolute. And we live in a time where there are no absolutes. It makes it really difficult. But God's message never changes. And so what we have to do is just kind of look at what Scripture says. So this is what the Apostle Paul said. He wrote to the church in Rome, in Romans 1. And when you read through Romans 1, you will see that Paul is saying, look, this is what we're up against. We live in a fallen world, and sin has made its effect on all of creation. And there's all kinds of immorality and brokenness and, and challenges going on in the world around us. And Paul says this, he said, but here's the deal. He said, when it comes to me and my faith, he wrote, I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And the reason I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ is because it, it alone, is the power of God at work for salvation. This message that God has entrusted his people with. And so as Joshua had to learn, we've got to stay focused on the promises, on the word of God, the promise of God's deliverance, God's salvation, that all the promises of God find its yes and its amen in Christ. And so Paul, as he writes this, he says, the message, it never changes. It never changes. But then there's a second thing that does change, the second M when it comes to the M's in ministry is it's the marketplace. And the marketplace... It's people and culture. And the marketplace is constantly changing. Right? It's a moving target. It's just constantly changing. Throughout the course of history, the marketplace has always changed. It always will change. New ideas come up. Right? Technology changes. How we do things. How we say things. How we implement things. So the marketplace is constantly changing. Matter of fact, one time when Jesus was on the scene in Mark chapter 6, verse 56, it tells us where Jesus went. It says, wherever he went, in villages, cities, or the countryside, they brought the sick out to where? To the marketplaces. That's where people gather. That's where people do business. That's where people connect, is in the marketplace. All right, so the marketplace is continually changing. It says, they begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched him were healed. So even as Jesus comes on the scene in the midst of a very different culture than what we see preceding him in the ancient world, in the scriptures, this biblical history of mankind through God's word, Jesus is still going to the marketplaces, engaging people with their issues, with their challenges, and he was such a bright light of hope that people were bringing people to him to be healed if they could just touch the fringe of his cloak if they could just come near him they know that they could get a touch of the power of the kingdom of God that would change their life forever and today that needs to be us the church in the midst of an ever-changing marketplace we need to be Jesus in the marketplace where we become a refuge of hope not as a building but as a people Wherever we are, in our neighborhoods and in the workplace, whatever. So the message never changes. We live in a marketplace that's constantly changing. And the third M is methods. And the challenge historically is that the methods of how we do things need to change to reach an ever-changing marketplace. And the challenge for us and for some of us that are like my age and up is that we were so used to doing things a certain way that it's hard embracing new methods to reaching people. 
And when you study church history, the church historically has really struggled getting up to date in culture and effectively reaching the shifting, changing marketplace. And so throughout church history, the church has always been behind, but they learned they had to change our methods. The message never changes, but how we reach and the things we do to reach people with the message of hope, the gospel of Christ, has to change so that we can reach them more effectively. So we do have to study. We do have to get sharper. We have to get more, you know, we have to study God's word and know how the message fits into this ever-changing marketplace to bring hope to a world. And so we may have to change how we do things. We're talking about this, wrestling through this, even in our men's group this past Wednesday. You know, and it's like, well, this is how we always did things, and this always worked. Well, that may not work today anymore. But the good news is we have the power of the Holy Spirit alive in us. We have the message of truth, and God's word goes forth and accomplishes its work, and it does not return void. And we're going to live on the promises, and we're going to listen to the Holy Spirit and allow him to lead us as we move forward into all that God has called us to. Let me just share this. John 14, 12, this is what Jesus said to his followers. And he said, I tell you the truth. There's a transition that's going to be going on here is what Jesus is saying. He's getting ready to go to the Father and he's leaving them alone, and he tells them this. He says, he's leaving them, not leaving them alone. He's going to send the Spirit. But he said, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. You can be Superman. Well, let's say this. You can be like Jesus. Because Jesus said to his followers, he says, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and not only that, and even greater works. Than what Jesus had done. Because he said, I am going to the Father. I'm going to be with the Father. You will do the same works that I've done, but you will even be able to do even greater works. Now, different, there's different opinions, you know, views on this whole thing about greater works. Some say it has to do with amplitude. There'll be, there'll be more. But as we fast forward into the book of Acts, we see the, or those first century Christians doing the same things that Jesus did. Right? Raising people from the dead, healing the sick, casting out demonic, you know, influences, forces, you know, spirits, all those things, and doing the work and just seeing people, thousands of people came to Christ in the midst of crises. And so we need to be, the, you know, the hands and the feet of Jesus and believe that God wants to do the same things that he did and even greater works than them, which means when it says greater works, that some of the things we do will have to change and how we do them as we see that even throughout the book of Acts, in order to reach a people and a culture that is shifting with the good news of Christ. And so as we study the book of Joshua, we're going to be looking at all the challenges that were in front of Joshua and how he led the charge. And he allowed God also to cultivate his heart, to become the heart of a warrior, that our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against each other. It's not against people with challenging thoughts and issues and way, views that are different from ours. Our battle is a spiritual battle. And that's the same thing that was taking place during the time of Joshua. And God wants us to trust him with his promises and believe that we can do the impossible. So my challenge for us over the next several weeks as we dive in this series, I want you to show up with capes on next week. <laughs> All right? God wants us to think differently, he wants us to think bigger, and he wants us to believe bigger, that we can never change the message of the good news of Christ, but we can address an ever-changing marketplace with methods that's going to change the world. Amen? Let's pray.